he was black. And Clarence Thomas, I mean, no one has greater black features than he. And he forgot all about that, he and his white wife, he married him once, but he forgot all about that until he got in trouble, then he called it a high-tech lynching. He realized that he was black. So some of us come back to black after we get in trouble. But thanks to you and many of we stay African. We stay African 24-7 around the clock. But I just wanted to say this, the inside-outside strategy, we gotta build outside. Outside, we gotta let this government know that we're gonna build our institutions to teach our own. We're gonna build our institutions to make sure that we buy from each other. And we gotta get that together, because we think the white man's ice is cold. You know, we'll pass by some of our stores and go to the Chinese store or some other store before we'll take care of our own business. We got to do all of that outside. I'm up on there on the inside. And the challenge on the inside is to maintain your principles, maintain your philosophical, ideological pinnings. I let everybody know that I am a Pan-Africanist, I'm a revolutionary, and I'm a Black Panther to my heart, no matter how far I get up in the I let them know I don't wear shirts and ties. I don't kiss no part of the anatomy that I ought not be kissing. So I plan on doing none of that up in there. And you'll be surprised, you get more respect, and I get much more coming into my community. When y'all come into East New York, come to Brooklyn, you'll see a $3.6 million park that got out of the city council, another $4 million park, $10 million for a youth center, $28 million to deal with structural unemployment. This is structural unemployment. They structure in the amount of unemployment they want to tolerate from year to year. And unemployment figures doesn't really tell the picture. When you look at East New York, 60,000 of us are eligible to be employed. I asked them, well, how many people are actually employed? Don't tell me the unemployment number. How many people have jobs? 23,000 out of 60,000 have a job. How many people are unemployed? 5,700. That's 28,000 that either have a job or accounted for unemployed. What about the other 32,000? They don't show up. So when you go into our communities and they tell you unemployment is 10%, those are the ones who are receiving unemployment benefits. But there's another 30% not even in the workforce. That's the stuff we gotta fight. So I wanna get up in there like I did in City Hall when I came. New York is an interesting place. I'm telling you, y'all think racism is thick in the South. Come on up to the Big Apple. They never gave us a bite of that apple. Come on up there. It is thick. Here you got 65% of New York City is people of color now. We are the new majority. I was telling the people the other day, 51 city council members, 25 are people of color. 14 Africans, well, <laughs> what do you call people who are supposed to be African? <laughs> Afro what? Afro-Saxons need uh, any more names? Because I need help here. Afro-Saxons. Well, there's 13 of them and, and one African. <laughs> we have 25 out of 51. And this is why I want to get us to get into electoral politics. It's about power. See, nobody cares how many conferences we have, nobody cares how much we have some deep, heavy analysis. They only care about what power do you have. Well, if we on the outside, we have the power to do for self, and we have the power to disrupt the... So y'all get quiet on that one, see what I'm saying? Let the church say amen. I'm leaving out there by myself. We have the power to disrupt. See, we have to, at some point, not now, maybe way down the road, we have to become ungovernable. Yeah. See, as long as they can govern you while they're oppressing you, they will keep oppressing you. 
at some point we have to become ungovernable and just non-cooperation. Can you imagine if the 2.3 million black people in New York City said, we're not cooperating anymore. Imagine if we just said, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to go downtown and hang out. And we're not going away. And on three, we're going to sneeze. The walls will come tumbling down. That's how much power we have. We don't understand the power. I'm one person. I went in City Hall, and I didn't vote for the speaker. The new speaker came in, and I said, I ain't voting for you. I'm, you know, after you, they decide who it is, the majority of the people say it's a unanimous vote. You know, all 51 of us, we vote for the speaker. So I don't like how you got in, and I'm not voting for you. Now, when you don't vote for the speaker, you get punished. They take your chair away. They don't let no money come to your neighborhoods. That's how much power the speaker has. Everybody told me, don't do it, Charles. If you don't vote for the speaker, you're going to get punished. I chaired a higher education committee. So they said they were going to snatch my chair. So I called the press conference. I said, I want to say to the speaker, I will accept no form of punishment. And if you try it, there's going to be war at City Hall. <laughs> speaker called me and said, Charles, war at City Hall? But I said, listen, I don't have no power to keep my chair. That's your power. I don't have no power to keep my committees. That's your power. I have the power to disrupt. And I want to let you know that every meeting, you're going to have to call the cops. Because I will stand up there and say this meeting is out of order. Until I get my chair back, I will parade up and I'll bring all my brothers and sisters from the hood. I'll tell them, don't put on your nice clothes, wear what you got, and bring what you got. I will, I will go, Sidney, you got to have them thinking you're crazy. I will lose my mind in this place. I will lose my mind. I'm telling you now, I'm not accepting no form of punishment. People who voted for her, got punished. <laughs> the Times called me up said, are they going to take your chair? They called me up and said, Charles, nobody's taking your chair. I said, forgive me if I don't celebrate for you not taking something that you shouldn't have been thinking about taking in the first place. That's the kind of fight we got to have on the power. That's one person. Imagine if the 14 of us in New York City would unite like that and say, we're not taking any mess. Imagine if all of us would have said to this president, this is a sick president. You know, this is a this is a president that in over his head. That boy is not bright. <laughs> I'm just not very bright. You know, you listen to him talk. Forget that he's bad on politics, Republican. He's just not a bright individual. Not a bright person. When I listen to him talk, and some of the things he says is incredible. And he's president. You know, you don't have to be an A student to be president. You know that. All you gotta do is get some C's. This man is out of his mind, but the real problem with this president, not just that he's sick and stupid and all of that, that he, he's wielding a kind of power now that we really have to get up in. That's why I want to go to Congress. I want to go to Washington. Right now, we're rocking New York City, but I want to bring that to Washington, D.C. I want to be with Cynthia McKinney. Get up there. Get up there. Get to Washington, you know, I'll struggle this inside outside struggle. Let me tell you how they have it set up, but we're still going to win. This place is set up in the political arena to maintain white power. Let me tell you what we don't think about that you don't really need to have. You don't need a Senate. You don't need a Senate. Do you know why they put a Senate there and the House of Representatives? There are 435 members of the House of Representatives, 43 blacks. 29 Latinos, that's 62. So if the whites are split, you can have leverage. But everything goes from the House to the Senate. There are 100 senators, 99 whites, and one, what did you call them? Afro-Saxon, Barack Obama. You know, and where did he come from? You know, I know some of y'all like him, but you know, Barack Obama, they created him. 
he came out of Illinois, maybe a nice guy, charismatic, nice speech. They made him the keynote speaker at the Democratic Convention. I thought they was bringing in Osama bin Laden. I didn't even know who. I said, Barack Obama, who, who is he? And all of a sudden, he's a superstar, rising star. You don't know him. None of you heard of him before. But they just threw him at you, said he's a star, and, and he's been awful quiet since he's been in the Senate. But you got a hundred senators. Every state in the United States, the majority of those states have whites. So for you to get elected to the Senate, unless they choose you, you're not going to get into the Senate. And then the Senate can vote everything against the House, and it goes nowhere. That maintains white power. You ever wonder why they have the Democratic primary? Why does it start in New Hampshire? And Iowa, isn't that where it starts? For what? There's only about 10 people in the whole place. And everything, I've been there, everything in New Hampshire is white. The grass, the, uh, everything. the people, the walls, the blocks, everything. Blackboards are white in New Hampshire. Everything in New Hampshire is white. We're like 0.00003% of the population. But you know, all the presidents got to go to New Hampshire. They got to go there because that's how they start off. And whoever wins New Hampshire and Ohio wins the election. Now, why do we start there? Why not start in Washington, D.C.? That's the capital. That's Chocolate City. That's why they don't want to start there. Washington, D.C. is not even a state. The reason why they don't want that to be a state, then you would automatically have two or three congressional representatives, plus you'll have two senators. So they don't want to make D.C. a state. That's another issue, things that we have to fight for for our power. But we got to put on a national agenda our reparations, political prisoners. These are issues that others have won. Puerto Ricans won the freedom of their political prisoners. And we sitting here still can't get ours out of prison. We got to make sure that this $2.8 trillion national budget, Katrina wasn't the real problem in New Orleans. New Orleans had levy problems before the levees broke. People are broke. What are you doing with poverty in a place that has $2.8 trillion? Do you know if you added up the deficit of every state in the United States, if you added up the total deficit, it's $74.5 billion. Iraq got $300 billion. They could balance every budget in the state, fix up every neighborhood, employ every person, give you health care, give quality education. They could do it overnight, but the political will isn't there for that. So we got to be revolutionary no matter where we go. And I get tired of having conferences where we call people Uncle Tom, thank your mamas, they don't care. You can call them what you want. They're going to win. Because we haven't built the movement yet to take them out on a local level. We should take over New York City. We can have the number one city in the world could be right in our hands. As I told you all the other night, a 55 billion dollar budget in New York City alone. New York City's budget is larger than every budget of 48 states in the United States. Do you know New York City's Board of Education's budget is 15 billion dollars to miseducate our children? 15 billion dollars. New Jersey has a state budget of 15 billion dollars. New York City's Board of Education's budget is 15 billion dollars 1.1 million children in New York City's Board of Education. Your kids, 85% black. 1.1 million children, a $15 billion budget. That's what we have to control. Let me stop with this. We are the greatest people on this planet. We are people who refuse to die. And any leader that comes to us and subscribes any permanency to our oppression is not fit to lead us. All right. Because all of this, brothers and sisters, is temporary. That's right. We're going to win. Yeah. Just like we beat slavery, I'm sure somebody told Harriet Tubman, Harriet, 
You better not get up on out of here. You better not leave. They're going to cut off your limbs. They're going to hang you if you get caught. Harriet put a Bible in one hand, a gun in the other hand. Said, I'm going to pray for some of you. The rest of you better not turn around. My sister walked. She walked from the south to the north and went back 19 times to free over 300 Africans. That's one of the greatest leaders in the history of our people is Happy Stuffing. Happy Stuffing. We got a feel like that. We got a feel like that. And I know we are strong African brothers, but half of us didn't want to go. And I know if it was me, I would have gotten the first 15 of you out and once I was free, free at last, thank God Almighty I'm free at last. Whoever didn't go on that first trip, I'm sorry for you. History would have called me one time Charlie. He freed 15 Africans and never went back again. My sister went back 19 times. But that's us. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison went from the prison to the presidency. Somebody had to told him in the 25th year, Nelson, forget about it. Apartheid is forever. You're never gonna get out of here. You might as well check out. He came out to be president. All of this stuff is temporary. We're gonna win. And when we do, and when we do, I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting back. <laughs> they say it shouldn't be like that. You gotta win and love everybody. Y'all take care of that part. <laughs> but after I win Congress, as I told y'all, after I win Congress, and then I'm gonna spend three, four, five years in Congress, I got to be mayor of New York City, because I want a old man. I'm telling you, and, and I'm running, as I run now, I tell people one of the things elected officials always try to do, how are you going to get the white folk, Charles? That's what they tell me all the time. You're too black. Lighten up. <laughs> Tone it down. Because you got to get the white vote. No, white people don't vote for us. I don't care how much you tone it down. I don't care how much you try to reach out. And plus, I'd be lying if I tried to get up there and say, you know, I love everybody. And, you know, half the stuff. I was an angry little young man. That's why I joined the Panthers, but I'm mature now. I can't do it. I can't do it. So rather than go there, I get a good night's sleep every night. And I tell people, when some white folk come up to me and say, you know, why are you so... You're scaring people. I said, I don't know how not to scare you. I don't know how to do that because I just don't know. No matter what I say, no matter what we do, if you're Malcolm, they'll kill you. If you're Martin Luther King, the Prince of Peace, they'll kill you. So, lay it forth. Just be you. Do you. Do you. And let the chip fall where they may. I met with a white group. They said, uh, Councilman, we got some whites that want to support you. They want to support you for uh, Congress. And they said, but you got to tone it down. If we, what about Mugabe? We don't like that you brought Mugabe to City Hall. You know they had a fit? Yeah, hey, I'm a little old councilman from East New York. I think I did a big thing for the African president to the city. You know, I thought they were going to roll out the red carpet and be happy. They said, Mugabe? You kidding? He's a dictator. He has human rights violations. So is George Bush. I said, you know, this is interesting. When Eon Smith, a murderer, colonizer of our people, came to New York City with Jimmy Carter, and we demonstrated, got all beat up and arrested. This was a murderer of African people. Stole our land, stole our people, called it Rhodesia after Cecil Rhodes. When you hear about that Rhodes Scholar, that's blood money, that's blood money. This was a Englishman who stole our diamonds, stole our gold mine. They're gonna give you something back, talking about here's a Rhodes Scholar. 
Bill Clinton. This is blood money. But when he came to New York City, they celebrated him. Nobody got angry with him. I bring a liberator and said, now listen, as long as Mugabe was going by the willing seller, willing buyer policy to get the land back, he was all right. You notice they didn't say nothing bad about Mugabe for 20 years. He had a revolution in 1980. But as long as he was saying, all right, Britain, America, if the white farmers who own 99% of the farms, if they're willing to sell, we'll buy it, the English, and give it back to the Africans, he was all right. He even said they could have 22% of the parliament. He was all right. But it came in 2000, and he said, that's enough. Too many of my generals, too many of my people have fought for this and not getting land. We changing the policy. And check this out, he was still nice. One farm, one farmer. Because most of the farmers, white farmers in Zimbabwe own seven and eight farms. He said, pick the one you want, I'm taking back the rest. All right. He's a dictator. Human rights violation. He became a demon when he changed the policy. Watch South Africa. Watch Namibia. They're going to have to follow what Mugabe did because in those places, whites still own 70, 80 percent of the land. When I went to Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe gave back 330,000 people some land, Africa, for the Africans. That land belongs to us. That land belongs to us. Why they? So I bring somebody that's taking back land from whites. Met with the white farmers even. I said, what's your problem? They said, we used to like President Mugabe. And then what happened? Well, then he's taking our land back. I said, well, that's not your land. You stole it in the first place. <laughs> he let you choose what to keep. Eon Smith, a murderer of our people, still owns a farm in Zimbabwe. A big farm, farm almost as big as Central Park. He still owns so much property. So they have the world thinking that Mugabe is the worst thing, you know? And this is a man that's just taken back his land for his people. He was nice enough to let you have one piece. We said, take that one too, you know, just throw them all out. Whether it's Mugabe, we deserve our reparations. Everybody else got paid. Jews got paid. Japanese got paid for their internment internment, held them for a bit, took some of their land, and in 1988, they got $6.2 billion for reparations. And why not the African? You work this land, especially in New York. We built New York City, and we deserve our fair share from that. We have to send a message to this nation that we're willing to do whatever is necessary for us to be liberated and Katrina is a wake-up call. That's right. That's a wake-up call. Kanye yeah. West was right. Bush right. doesn't care about That's you. Right. And I'm telling you something. Katrina wasn't a problem. I told y'all I renamed the hurricane. It's Hurricane FEMA Bush. <laughs> because Katrina didn't do anything. FEMA and Bush did. And if you can impeach Clinton for Monica, impeach Bush for Katrina. Because he should be, this is a crime against humanity. It is. You it know is. what happened to our people there. And New Orleans shouldn't exist as it did in the first place. In New York City, the South Bronx is the most impoverished district in the country. The South Bronx is the poorest district in the country. And yet it's in New York City. $55 billion budget. A billionaire mayor, mm -hmm. Michael Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. You ever wonder why a man worth $5 billion wants a job paying $200,000 a year? Because he doesn't have $55 billion. That's why when I become mayor, get a hold of that $55 billion. Y'all want some land, some contracts. That's what it's about. Y'all come to New York because we're going to have a good time. I'm going to give everything to black people. Y'all better hurry up, and I want to let y'all know now, as I tell everybody everywhere I go, you better shake my hand today, 
Because when I become mayor, I'm getting me a Pope mobile, you know, that bubble, the bubble around the Pope mobile. And when I come out of the Pope mobile, I'm going to have a bulletproof bubble suit. Nobody is coming near me because what I do for you, they're going to want to take me out for sure. Because I'm giving it up. I told those white folks that met with me, they said, calm down. I said, no, I'm not going to tone it down. I'm going to tone it up. This is a new black man. You can't tell me how to be. Just what is your interest? And if it doesn't violate ours, I'll see what I can do for you. If it does, bye. I can win without you. So they don't like that. I told people 60% of this district is black, 16% is white. So I'm going to capitulate to white people. I said, no, but our problem is us. Just getting the view. They say you shouldn't talk to white people like that. You know, we got it so bad. I'm in the hallway sometime with my black colleagues. Nobody's in the hall but us. And they say, uh, yeah, you know the way. What you whispering for? Ain't nobody here but us. You don't have to whisper and say the white man. I get on the elevator and I see white man. I say they get on my white man get on my last nerve. <laughs> Do you know what the white man did to me the other day? I make up stories about sitting on the elevator. Just fabricate something, anything. Just let them know I'm talking about. It. And then they